I'm on Darty Farms. We're just outside of what I'm going to call the rolling hills of Amish country in northeast Ohio. I took several extra turns to get here, and it was a nice adventure to get out. But when we arrived, who knew that on top of a hill, we'd find Bill Darty and his son Kyle to greet us. And Bill, thanks for having us out to check out the farm. Let's back up and uh, jump into the dairy world. How long have you been a part of uh, the dairy industry? I'm 57 years old. We've been milking cows all my life. Uh, my dad's 89, he'll be 90. He's been milking cows all his life. Uh, but we were milking in a 50 year old double four that dad built in 1970 for 45 cows. We were trying to milk 133 cows through that same facility. Uh, knew we needed to do something. What was a day like then? We got up at 3 a.m. every morning for the last 25 years to try and beat the milk truck by 8, 8.15. Uh, get done with milking, do the keep, feed the calves, eat breakfast, take a nap, and then we're farming 15, 1600 acres as well. So we have plenty of field work and other other chores to keep us busy. We knew we were getting to the point we either had to do something or get out of the dairy industry. So, at what point or at what event did you decide that there's more for us in dairy, and we've got to figure out how to move this forward? So we felt obviously 2014 was a very good year for the dairy industry. Milk prices were $25 a hundred weight, but since then they've struggled. Farming 1,600 acres, we felt like we were making money selling grain, losing money trying to produce milk. We, we had to do something, either exit the dairy industry or improve our situation. And as we saw Kyle coming out of college, well, how are we going to fit Kyle into this equation? Are we going to try to rent more ground, compete against neighbors, or are we going to try to to do something ourselves that we can grow kind of within. And we chose to grow within, you know, so we, we chose a spot, looked at about eight different sites with our vet. And this was his second choice, this was our first choice, and we're very pleased with the choice we made. Um, about four years ago, when Kyle was a uh, senior in high school, we decided uh, we need to start looking at what options we can do. Took a, a family vacation, looked, visited some dairies, and since then decided robots was how we wanted to go. Only dairy guys go on vacation of course. for dairy farms of course. to visit, but okay. And uh, met Josh Kepler from WG Dairy and uh, had a lot of contacts with him. Are there dairies in this area? As we went to see our daughters play basketball, we visited a lot of dairies in Michigan and Wisconsin. and. Um, have probably visited between 20 and 30 robotic dairies. We've got a lot of good ideas. We found robots will milk your cows. We were very confident in that. It's just how do you manage the parts around the robots? How do you handle cows and sort pens and fetch pens and things like that? And we've learned a lot over the past four years on that and felt pretty confident going into this what we wanted. Sent Kyle to a dairy initiatives conference in Wisconsin on uh, dairy robotic barn design came home with this barn design and we kind of tweaked some things but we're, we're very pleased with the results the question we kind of joked in on the barn is we were ready to expand the dairy industry we just needed a 22 year old college graduate to figure out how to do it and kyle came home with the talents from ati and a couple extra programs he'd been through to pretty much put all of this on paper and it's fun to watch him walk through the barn and explain it uh, I knew how to milk cows when I worked here, but I didn't know why we milked cows the way we did. When I went to ATI, we kind of broke down each, uh, each step of the dairy process step by step, and one of my classes was called facilities. So basically all we did was look at the facility of a barn and why we did it that way, and uh, took what I learned from there and um, watched a bunch of webinars on just robotic barn design. Uh, normal parlor barns are pretty easy to make. They're not very, all of them are about the same. Robot barns, there's hundred different ways you can lay barns out. So we tried to uh, do our homework on how will we lay the barn out and put the robots that will make it most uh, labor efficient. So if we need a cow, she is right here instead of being all the way down at the end of the barn. So we have to walk all the way out to get her. So just a lot of, uh, a lot of little details that in the end just make, make a world of difference. So the thing that has worked the best for us is what we call a sort pen. So a sort pen is just the pen that the cows go to after the robot milks her. So if this cow's in heat, I'd say put her in the sort pen. She's in the sort pen. We come out of the combine in the night and we got to breed a cow. We can come in at 9 o'clock, grab a straw, and breed her right there. That way we don't have to walk down to the end of the barn. That's The sort pen is the, the biggest part of the barn, the most efficient part of the barn. Um, we also have a work pit in there where we can uh, uh, treat, treat udders if we need to. Down below we have the parlor where we could uh, be eye level with the udder. Up here, there's no pit, 
or anything where we're eye level with the udder, so we'd have to bend down. Um, so we have two work pits where we can uh, be eye level with the udder, that way we can work on the udder. Well, Bill, once you knew that Kyle was uh, pretty much invested mentally in the dairy industry and, and had school behind him and was able to draw the building and things up, what kind of partners does it take then to feel confident that this thing's all going to come together? Because I'm going to guess no one entity does all of this for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we honestly talked to five banks and farm credit to get financing. Uh, that was a, a very good uh, process for our family to go through, a lot of uh, profit loss statements, um, balance sheets, things like that, but uh, good to f get a feel for where you're at. Worked immensely with WG Dairy on, uh, you could say they were our general contractor on taking bids for the barn, the concrete, the electric. We need to compare apples to apples and competition is a good thing. Um, you know, having several people bid on things worked to our advantage. Uh, a lot of different entities had to go hand in hand and work together, and they did. We started pushing ground uh, June 21st, 2019, started milking in the new facility March 10th of 2020, which all that had to happen was really a pretty quick turnaround, and we felt very blessed with how it all went together. So how big's the barn? Barn's 360 feet long, 132 feet wide, plus about 50 feet for the milk house. Uh, at a 2% slope going back into the hill for the flush system. Milk tanks, how big? 7,000 gallons, a large semi-tanker, holds about 60,000 pounds. We're currently shipping just over half of that. How many fans? 40 variable speed fans kick on at 65 degrees at 9% capacity, 77 degrees or 100% capacity. Very efficient. Yeah, and that's one of the main things when you walk through the barn. It's comfortable out there. When I pulled up, it was 88 degrees. It was 90 degrees when I came through Millersburg, and I came up, stepped in the barn, and it was like, wow, what a remarkable difference, and that's air and moisture. Yes, we have sprinklers over the cows on the feed bunks, kick on every 20 minutes when it's over 82 degrees, soak the cows for 40 seconds, then the fans help evaporate that moisture off the cow. It's the most efficient way to cool a cow. works really well. Since you mentioned feed bucks, what's the, what's the red thing that drives around and it's called Moves a Juno feed. feed pusher from Laley. It goes around every two hours and automatically push, pushes the feed back up. If we didn't have that, we'd have to have somebody in a skid steer or a tractor with a blade every you know, three or four or five times a day pushing the feed up. It takes labor, takes fuel, takes machinery. This does it with electric, recharges itself. Uh, very efficient way to, to push the feed up. Does it all night? Yes, every two hours. And it's got a little beep on it. The cows, cows wait for it to go by and all go right coming, back up to eat. Come back up to eat, absolutely. Kind of like great. the ice cream truck driving through the neighborhood. Yes, yes. So take us through the barn. I mean, you've got all the latest. Some people would say maybe, you know, there's the, uh, the bed system where they use rubber mats and things. You use sand. Yes. What helped to make those decisions? Uh, sand is inorganic. We use green sawdust in our old facility. Had a lot of issues with mastitis. Sand being inorganic, bacteria doesn't grow on it as well. Uh, it's worked great. Our Various issues uh, have helped bring our somatic cell count from 350,000 in our old facility to about 180,000 here. Anything under 225, our co-op pays a quality premium, and it's helped immensely from that standpoint. We were there and got to see the flush system, and that 2% grade, with a little pressure, it moves a lot of material right down and out regularly. Really does, and when it gets to the sand lane, uh, water slows down, sand settles out, the water manure drain off, we scoop that sand up, pile it on our beach, 5% slope concrete, let it dry out in the sun, the water and manure run off. We scoop that up, we re reuse that sand, put it back in the free stalls, we reuse the water, reuse it for flushing, reuse the manure as an, or as an organic fertilizer base, spread it on our fields twice a year. But the key to the whole thing to make it work was the robotic milkers. Yes. Tell us about what you were looking for in a robotic, in a robotic milker and what it was designed to help you do here on the farm? The big thing is labor. So I said I got up at 3 a.m. I started milking about 25 after 3 every morning, got done about 8, 8.15 every morning. So that was me and usually Kyle would come in about 5, my dad would come in at 6, somebody would go scrape, but we'd typically have one or two people in the parlor all that time. And then I had high school boys did the same thing at night. Just a lot of labor standing, not the most efficient thing in the world. We started to look at robots, saw how efficient they were, how dependable they were. They don't get mad, they don't get sick, they don't take vacations, and very dependable. And, and they'll call you when they have a problem. They call me when they have a problem. As we get into this, the further we go, the more we're working beyond that. We do preventative maintenance with WG Dairy to try to avoid as many problems as possible. 
Now you have how many robots? Four robots, approximately 60 per cow is our goal. And how do you break the cows out? How do they know which line to go to, if you so will? So right now we have two, two robots on each side. One side is primarily first calf heifers because we bought a lot of first calf heifers to expand. Our other side is second and lactation and, and older. And uh, there's two robots in each pen. Each cow can go to either, either robot in each pen. Bill, as you uh, look to the robotic system and everything it did, one of the things you pointed out several times was the somatic count and what that does for a dairyman. The robot is able to help you with that whole process and separate milk that needs to go in the tank versus it doesn't. What was that like before? It's just been an immense improvement. So we DHI tested once a month, so we knew the somatic cell count of every cow in the herd one day of the month. Now the robot test the somatic cell count of each cow every third milking. We average three to 3.2 milkings per day, so basically each cow gets tested one, one time a day. We can go on a computer and adjust those cows. Cows with high somatic cell counts, we divert that milk into buckets, utilize it to feed calves. Everybody else goes into the bulk tank. It's brought our somatic cell count down immensely from 350 to 180,000, and uh, milk quality is much better. We're not wasting the milk. We're still utilizing it to feed calves, but we're keeping the quality milk to sell. It's amazing, we never realized how much. We used to use a lot of antibiotics. We quit using antibiotics altogether. Most cows will fluctuate. They might jump up for two or three days and then drop back down very rapidly, just curing themselves. And uh, also milking three times a day is more advantageous than milking twice a day. It helps clean that mastitis out more often. And all in all, it's, it's, you know, it's less money to the vet for, for mastitis therapy expense. And uh, much better milk quality. It's worked very well. Now, each cow has its own identity when it comes into the milker. Uh, the robot knows its cow number, knows its history, and knows things to check for, and knows how much extra feed to give them because they've been a good girl. Yes, yes. So a cow milking 70 pounds will get approximately four pounds of grain. A cow milking uh, 140 pounds will get about 24 pounds of grain. So they want to come back and what I say, they get their candy. They want to come back and get candy. That, that drives a cow back in. We have some cows milking up to five and a half times a day. Typically those are cows milking over 100 pounds because they get more grain. They like to come back and get that candy. But it's based on their production level. And they have a partial mixed ration that's balanced for 70 to 80 pounds and then anything above that, they just get more grain and it, it works very well. So when the cow comes in, she's got a transponder around her neck, a little transponder right behind her ear. Left ear we found Left out ear, is critical. Left ear, yes. The laser reads it when she comes in. So the cow, the brushes come in, cows, the brushes brush each teat twice. The brushes will kick out. It'll put a uh, cleaning solution on the brushes. They'll go back in, brush each teat one more time with a blow of some air on it to help dry it. Brushes kick out of the way, and then a laser kicks on to find the teats, and the inflation's attached to each teat based on where the labor, laser is bouncing off of. Works very efficiently. I don't know what else we could wrap up with other than to say, as you look at it through the whole experience, if someone's saying, I've loved dairy all my life, I've got kids I think that would want to do this, how would they embrace the process of finding out more and understanding what dairy might be like for them under this new world, if you will? Visit dairies. We visited 20 to 30 robotic dairies once we realized we wanted to manage cows pretty much with the family we had, family and workforce we had. We didn't really want to get bigger with labor. We wanted to just manage cows. This allowed us that opportunity. We basically are doubling our herd with a little bit less part-time help and the same labor otherwise. Still farming 1,600 acres. Cows will still get milked. We can be 15 miles away uh, harvesting corn, planting corn. Cows are still getting milked, and it just gives us some, some great opportunities. You know, find out, talk to WG Dairy, uh, they can point you in directions, uh, but go visit as many dairies as you can if you're interested. It's a, just a, a great way to get educated. We've enjoyed the day visiting at Darty Farms and checking out today's dairy industry. It's always fun to find someone who loves what they're doing and try to figure out how to preserve it into the future. Thanks for joining us from Darty Farms. I'm Dale Mignot.